Some call me Steve, Dad, Husband or Friend. Others might call me Boss, Coach or Mentor. Today you can call me the Leadership Hacker. Thanks for listening in, I really appreciate it. My job as the Leadership Hacker is to hack into the minds, experiences, habits and learning of great leaders, C-suite executives, authors and development experts so that I can assist you developing your understanding and awareness of leadership. I'm Steve Rush and I'm your host today. I'm the author of Leadership Cake. I'm a transformation consultant and leadership coach and can't wait to start sharing all things leadership with you. Our special guest on today's show is Joseph O'Connor. He's one of the world's leaders in NLP and NLP coaching and author of Coaching the Brain. But before we get a chance to speak with Joseph, it's a Leadership Hacking News. How many leaders does it take to change a light bulb? Well, the answer is one. However, it takes seven or eight leaders to decide that it's the right light bulb to change, that it needs changing now, and that we have the right technical kit and equipment to change the light bulb. So what am I getting at here? Well, I asked a question. What is the optimum number of leaders that we need typically in a quorum to make the right decisions? There's lots of research about this. So I dove in to Harvard Business Review and Governance Today. Harvard Business Review claims that seven is the right number and that odd numbers, in fact, of any criteria is a good thing. While Governance Today said it was eight to 10. Getting back to the actual number, Think about the benefits of a large group. The more people you have, theoretically, the better chance you have of getting the best information. However, if that said seven or 10 have really open channels of communication, have created a flow of information through their workforce, then it is probably the right number. What is critically important, however, is the diversity of that seven to 10, making sure they bring social sensitivity to situations making sure that they reflect the true voice of their workforce in those meetings and have the real clarity of understanding of expectations from not only their workforce, but their shareholders too. Going way back to the 1970s, research concluded by Hackman and Viedmar on the optimum size of groups for membership communication and outcomes actually composed an optimum size of 4.6. This is based on research and science and still holds true somewhat today. Their study concluded that senior teams operate best when the optimum size of number is about seven, correlated with our recent research. The research and studies provide evidence that the more the numbers are in a team, and particularly a leadership team, the more likely the team is to encounter problems with its functioning and its outcomes. So get in the size right, get in the diversity of your team right, tick, but let's not forget engagement of that team is incredibly important and size alone is not sufficient in creating a winning success. That success depends on you as the leader of that leadership team, encouraging, engaging and facilitating great conversations so that they put their energy to the front so that you all collectively can achieve your goals. And for those listeners here today who have maybe smaller teams than seven in its entirety, Who's on your personal board? How do you extend that team so you get diversity of thinking, input and ideas? That's been the Lucha Packer News. Let's dive into the show. Our special guest today is Joseph O'Connor. He's the founder of the Neuroscience Coaching Centre, co-founder of the ICC, that's the International Coaching Community, and he's one of the most renowned experts on NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming. Joseph's written dozens of articles and over 20 books on the education of NLP and coaching. In his new book, Coaching the Brain, he explores how we can use our knowledge of the brain to help ourselves and others learn. We're truly in the presence of one of the world's global thought leaders in this space. Joseph, welcome to the show. Thanks, Steve. It's great to be here. Many thanks for those kind words. You're very welcome. You have an incredible history. There are very few guests that I get to speak to where I already have a bunch of their books that have taught me on my journey and yours is one of those so I'm delighted that we have the chance to speak it through tell us a bit about that journey for you 
Originally, <laughs> many years ago, I, I was a professional guitarist. I was a professional musician. And um, this got me into an interest, of course, in, in how we perform, you know, how, how people do, do well or not. Because if you're playing classical guitar in front of a group of people, it's, uh, it's quite nerve-wracking. So I found that with, with most players, I could teach them how to play, but I couldn't teach them how to be able to give their best in front of a, a challenging audience, if you see what I mean. You know, that's just the first thing. You know, I think in any kind of skill, you can teach the skill, you can learn the skill, but it's something else to actually be able to do the skill <laughs> when you actually when you really need to, especially if it's under challenging conditions. So this really got me interested in, first right. of all, NLP, coaching, um, you know, in a game of, of all sorts of things, and really how we can get out of our own way um, when we really need to, to deliver. And since then, you have really dedicated almost a lifetime's work in that subject of NLP and coaching. What were the things that really drew you into that as a genre and as a as a philosophy, if you like? Well, I've always been interested in in the inner game, as it were. Um, it, it's fantastic to see people who are really, really good at something. You know, whether it's uh, athletics, um, music, uh, theatre presentations teaching it doesn't matter in, in anything you see someone who's really really good at something and you you it looks easy uh, I can remember as a, as a kid seeing these great guitarists and thinking hey I could do that you know that looks really easy and then when you actually come to do it um, it's not it's quite different so it's like what what goes on inside as it were uh, these these great people that, that allow them to to not only do so well but also to make it look so easy uh, and I guess this is what this is what interested me all through um, when when I was learning anything and um, that that inner game thing really and the inner game as you call it it's almost where NLP really overlays particularly well so the neuro is the the neocortex the part of our brain that's kind of supportive and then of course yeah. neuro and linguistic is in how we teach our brain to perform in a certain way and it is about teaching and habits isn't it yes it is i mean i, I got into nlp <laughs> again through music which were, which was funny but yes neuro you know the brain the mind um how we think linguistic how we communicate because language is just so amazing there aren't that many words, but the ways that we can put them together in, in, uh, to be able to communicate with ourselves and with others is just incredible. And my father was an actor and a writer as well. So I kind of got that quite early. And then programming, because I don't think the brain really works as a, as a computer. I think that's an outmoded metaphor. But the programming in the sense of how do we accomplish things you know how do we actually do things how does it all work together in order to get things done um, i think that's the basis of nlp and then of course those things in terms of what do we want what are our goals what's important to us what do we believe how do we act this is all really important in coaching uh, and, and getting the best from ourselves and from other people and the irony of course is that we've all been programming our brain broadly unconsciously from the moment that we were aware of the, the first environmental things around us we started that coding and programming from a very early age often that sends us on a track which we either recognize as helpful or holds us back right yeah well you know when we're when we're babies and children we just take in the world and uh, we we're not very we don't discriminate very much about it you know we we don't make judgments about it so much so we're very, very sensitive. I think that's the great strength of human beings. We're incredibly sensitive to each other, to language, to, to the messages we receive. And we're always, always looking to try and make it mean something, uh, to try and, and understand it and, and to, to help to predict what, what's going to happen. Because a random world, you know, where we just don't know what's going to happen next, we can't prepare for it. It's 
it's awful. It's an awful idea. So we're always trying to predict. We're always trying to have ideas, beliefs, mental models that allow us to predict and find our way through the world in, in the best way. Um, and yes, we're very sensitive to this. And of course, our great strength and weakness is um, our ability to, to learn and to take in information. And on a, a neuroscience point of view, it's that neuroplasticity of the brain. It's the brain's ability to change itself in in response to experience so i like to think of the brain as a verb mm. you know we kind of when we think of the brain we kind of think of a big lump of, of whatever uh, it's a bit like soft butter really but it, it's it's stuff but it's really a verb it's really an organ for converting our experience uh, into nervous tissue mm. and then the nervous tissue in the brain in turn um, influences our experience and what we do and what we can do in on from that so it's an amazing dynamic process and our brain's changing all the time you know my brain's changing yours is changing the, our listeners brains will be changed after listening to this podcast uh, you can't help it we we are influenced by that and that's both a blessing and a curse because in terms of the brain the brain doesn't discriminate between some really poor messages and some really good ones. Mm. So it doesn't matter whether people are telling you or you're telling yourself more insidiously, uh, you know, I'm no good, I can't do this, um, this will never work. All of these repetitive thoughts are going to build up the connections in the brain that's going to start to make that a habit of thinking. In other words, a, a thought that's going to be the default, easiest thought to fall into in response to whatever happens. Yeah. So the brain doesn't discriminate about that. If you, re if you repeat that and if you get those messages, um, that's what the brain learns. Uh, whereas, of course, we don't want to learn that sort of thing. We want the messages of, you know, you're good, you can do this, this is great, this is interesting. But we've, we've got to take charge of our own learning mm. very often. And the reality is, as a species, a human being, human sapiens, we really want it to be as straightforward and as easy as possible. We often look for the quickest, fastest, easiest route because our body doesn't like to face into the emotions that come with that challenge, right? No, indeed. And um, we're quite lazy thinkers. There's this uh, idea of the cognitive miser, you know. Yeah. It, it's, it's hard work to think clearly and, and well and, and we tend to move away from it which uh, means that sometimes the, the sapiens part <laughs> doesn't work so well right. <laughs> my sapiens and i um noticed that you drew a correlation early in your studies when you were looking at professional musicians who were incredibly well versed and you, you facing that kind of ambition to want to do the same if we apply the the approach of neuroscience to those individuals who are who excel at anything actually mm. the two or three things that you notice that happen alongside is one there's repetition and practice because without that you you don't get good yeah. but also there is a definite conditioning of the mind that says i can which keeps people going rather than i can't and holds people back and that's also a core part of nlp teachings isn't it oh yes yeah absolutely you know, there's that saying, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. Yeah. Because in that sense, you've conditioned yourself to, to, or put it this way, if you're going to succeed, then that, it's good to believe it, right? You go into it fully, wholeheartedly, committedly. You're much more likely to succeed uh, than if you go into it thinking, oh, well, maybe, you know, I'm not so sure about this. I'm not so good. Um, that's kind of setting yourself up for failure. Now, there's no guarantees in the end, of course. Um, you may or may not get what you want, but you're more likely if you enter into it with those more positive intentions and, and positive ideas. Yeah. And the, the repetition is important, absolutely. That's the way that we build habits, and we want to build habits because habits just help us to do things automatically, and we don't want to have to think over carefully everything that we possibly do. Yeah, these habits are really important, but uh, they're also, uh, there's the, the saying, I think, from the Chinese originally, that habits start as cobwebs, but they may end as chains. Mm. 
you know, we, we want to be careful what sort of habits we form because they're incredibly powerful. Yeah, be careful what you wish for and all that, isn't it? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So we're going to dive into a little bit about coaching the brain and neuroplasticity and neuroscience in a moment. Before I do, though, I'm just intrigued to dive into the whole community that you set up and founded. So the ICC is definitely one of the most recognized international coaching communities in the world. Mm. And that must be a fantastic experience to have seen that grow from a, a little acorn into hundreds of trees all over the world now. Tell me a little bit about the ICC. Yes. Well, we started the ICC myself and, and my wife and partner, Andrea. We started it in Brazil, in fact, uh, around about 2001. We wanted to form something that, that encapsulated those three words, like coaching, yes, absolutely. We were both coaches. We were both passionate and are passionate about helping people to be the best they can be, as, as well as ourselves. Um, so coaching, yes, international. We started internationally. Uh, the first trainings that we gave, um, wow, the first was in Poland, I think. The second was in Rio de Janeiro. The third was in um Orebro in Sweden so it's like um it was international right from the start and you know there's something about coaching something about people and helping people in this way that is international it, it transcends culture and, and country uh when you dig down we're all human beings and, and we all respond to the same basic things of, of what we want and what's important to us so it Inter that international was, was very important from the start. And then community, we chose that word quite carefully because a community is a group of people that wants to be together, that, um, that shares value. Um, and that, that's, I think, very important um, yeah. for a group of people because, yes, you can, you can kind of group together, you can be together, but do you want to be together? Do you, do you share that, those values? And that, for, for us, was really important. So, yes, we, we started then, and now the ICC has, uh, oh, I don't know the exact numbers, but something like 16,000 um, trained, uh, certified coaches in over 60 countries. Uh, and we have uh, 50 trainers uh, all over the world. Yeah. So it's, it's wonderful to see. Amazing legacy, amazing legacy. And then fast forward to today, what's the focus of both you and Andrea's work today? Well, I'm particularly interested at the moment um, in creativity. This kind of uh, strange word, uh, you know, we say creativity, but it's really a process. It's, again, it's really about, well, how are you thinking? What are you doing? And it's probably the most valued and valuable commodity um, process, gift, whatever you want to call it, talent that there is around. Because, you know, as, as the world moves so far, especially technologically, um, you can create good products and have good ideas. But then, you know, <laughs> maybe a year, maybe months, maybe weeks later, um, the world's caught up and you've got to continue to do it. Mm. So I think the and I think you can see this really clearly with, with businesses. The businesses that are doing well are the, the fast, nimble, creative ones that are always being able to change and adapt and come up with something that works rather than the more monolithic, uh, you know, here's the product and this is great and this is how it's going to be. You've got to keep changing. So that, that ability to, to come up with something new that works, that's appropriate, that fits, mm -hmm is just uh, so important and, and something that I've got really interested in and how it relates to our intuitions about um, what to do and, and what works. Yeah, and I've also had a, a passion for creativity and studied it too and delighted we can kick this around because what I've found in my research and exploring this whole philosophy is this is something that as young children we did incredibly well we were naturally intuitive and we were naturally would go with our gut feel and we would be creative and we would play but as we got a little bit older and more mature in our years and our days it often was squeezed out of us unconsciously or consciously in some cases by our environment What's the reason from your 
perspective, do you think that some people really struggle with this whole label of creativity? Well, yeah, I mean, a lot of people think they aren't creative. They think that it's some kind of uh, magical talent that you're born with or not. And I don't think that's true at all. I think we're all naturally creative just by virtue of being human. Right. But I, I think that, I mean, you're quite right about children and being creative. Uh, it's, and I can remember myself, and I think we all can, of those those feelings when we were young, when it's just yeah, we we could we could just think and play, and, and it would be very spontaneous and flowing. And then gradually, as you say, this this tends to to go. And I think, I mean, there's many reasons, but I think one of the reasons is um, the way sometimes that that people are taught, like here's the right answer, okay. Mm. Uh, uh, and this is how it's done. And well, yes, this is all very interesting what you're doing, but you know, you're not you're not quite right. This is a little bit silly. This is how it's done. This is the right answer. And we get um, imprisoned by the the bars of the right answer, and then we forget all about the other answers, and we forget that the right answer is only right in terms of the right question. It's the question that's important, not the answer. Yeah. The answer is only a response to the question. If you generate interesting, good, powerful and new questions, uh, you're going to get better answers. And I remember reading a, a, a statistic somewhere and I can't remember it exactly, unfortunately, but it's something like at the age of, of seven, uh, the average child asks something like 200 questions a day. Right. <laughs> by by the age of of twenty seven, it's down to about four questions a day, Blimey. of which one is probably what's for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know, you can see that, and it, that I think encapsulates what what happens with us um, and how we tend to kind of sink into this. Well, yeah, but all the answers are out there. Let's just fit into them. And do you think there's something to do with habit here as well? We get out of the habit of being creative. We get out of the habit of play. We get out of the habit of asking questions. Yeah, we do. You know, for, again, from the neuroscience point of view, a habit is something that you've practiced with attention. And if it's a good habit, you've, you, it fits and um, you've done it and you've built it up consciously. So you forget about it. You know, all of these things that we do automatically, we don't want to have to think about them. We forget about them. There's something I think there's something really important about choosing your habits. Well, if you choose your habits well, um, including habits of thinking, then you're going to do much better. And if one of those habits is thinking, yes, of, yeah, of course, I'm creative, even if it's only in small ways. Um, I am creative, I am intuitive, I can do this. And to give yourself the opportunity to do it and to continue to repeat doing it, although, of course, you're not always going to be so successful as you, you would like. It's that repetition, it's the attention, um, it's the emotion uh, and the value behind it that's going to drive you forward. And you'll get better at it. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. And as part of the... Uh the limbic system called the basal ganglia whose job it is to keep us in that habit and as soon as we don't give it attention it starts to lose that habit and all the while we think that habits formed we can also lose habits as quickly as we can repeat them and gain them well we can we, yeah we can lose habits um and of course a lot of people want to lose habits yeah and that's fine uh and you can of course and the way to lose a habit is to replace it by another one it's, uh, I like the metaphor of, of the ski slope. It's like you've got the ski slope with this unbroken snow, which is like the metaphor for the, the brain, uh, and there aren't any connections. So then the first skier goes down and makes a track, and the second skier, because the first the, there's already a track in the snow, tends to follow that, and the third and the fourth. So that if, after a while, because so many skiers have gone down in the same way, you've got this track, and that's the habit. Yeah. And, and that's the connection in the brain that's been worn down. So that's the, the default way that people will go down. Now, if you want to change the habit, what you have to do is to ski down another way, not use the ski track that's already there. Yeah. And if you continue then to ski down the other way, you'll make a track there and the snow will cover over the first one. And so we are we are more in control. We are in control of our habits. 
uh, as long as we feel that we are and we can change them when we become aware of them. And of course, the, the difficulty is always the habit is, is the easy. It's the path of the, the least resistance. It's a fabulous analogy. I'll be absolutely using that from today onwards. Thank you for sharing it. <laughs> Good. So let's dive into the book, Coaching the Brain. What was the inspiration for you having, and if I can be so bold, you've covered pretty much every genre across the whole NLP and coaching landscape that I can see. Then coaching the brain seems like an obvious place to fit because that's pretty much all of the teachings I think you've had in the past. But what was the inspiration for the book for you? Well, um, two things. I like to write books on things I'm interested in and I want to learn about. So I don't like to, I don't want to write a book on, on something that I feel that I know a lot about and I'm an expert on and it's just kind of filling in the pages. I want to write something that I'm interested in. And I got very, I've always been interested in neuroscience. And from a coaching point of view, well, from any point of view, really, I like to look at the gaps, what's missing um, in, in some study, in the same way that as a coach, uh, when you ask questions, uh, and when people are talking to you, it's, of course, interesting to know what they're saying. But it's also very interesting to know what they're not saying, what's missing what could or even should be there in order to understand what's going on. So in the same way, um, if we go back a few years, there wasn't a great deal of, of uh, representation of neuroscience in coaching. That's right. Um, and I thought this was a gap, and I thought it was important, because the more we know about the brain, the more we can understand the, the purely psychological models of what works and what doesn't work. And we can refine them. And we can also change them. We can also get new ones because the neuroscience, cognitive neuroscience is the biology of the mind. So to understand that biology of the mind is going to help us to understand our mind and others and to use it better. So the, the book came from that. It's like, yeah, neuroscience is interesting. Uh, I think I want to learn about this. I think it needs to be in coaching. So actually, I, I went first of all to New York to get a brain scan for myself. Ah. <laughs> uh, it's like, you know, I, I, let's start with yourself, of course. I wasn't ill in any way, but I did want to, um, to do this and to find out. So this was very interesting. And I came back with a lot of uh, highly colored photographs and a lot of insight into how I think and, and some, I, you know, some kind of explanations about, oh, yeah, that's always puzzled me. Well, yeah, that's 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 how it works after all. And so took the book from there, talking with many people, of course, reading uh, and putting it together, but always with a sense of of the, the subtitle of the book, which is um, practical applications of neuroscience to coaching. Yeah. Because, yeah, of course, neuroscience is interesting and you can really delve into it, how the brain works. And you can go into all the Latin names of all the, the bits that are there. Um, but in the end, and unless you can actually use, for me anyway, unless you can actually use that to make a difference uh, in for yourself and for other people, then it's, for me, it's, uh, you know, it's only the first step. So, you know, hey, yeah, how can we use this? How, what's important? And that, that's how the book came about. And uh, I observe in my coaching career, so I've been coaching professionally and as an amateur coach, probably for 25 years. Mm. And it wasn't until I really understood the impact of neuroscience on my coach E mm. that I really changed my coaching game. Mm. Because it is as simple as just understanding some, some of the subtle levers we might want to pull or not, as the case may be, the language we could choose, the environment we're in. Mm. All of these have an effect on an outcome, don't they? Yes. Oh, yes, they do. So how do we go about coaching the brain specifically? Uh, well, uh, when, when you say that's fine, it's an interesting question, because paradoxically, my, my immediate response um, would be, well, we, we've got to be careful not to isolate the brain and to think about when, you, when you're coaching somebody, you're just coaching their mind or their brain or, yeah. or any particular part of them. And of course, as coaches, we know and all good coaches know that you're, you're coaching a human being, mind, body, spirit all the time. So in terms of, of that metaphor of coaching the brain, it's, well, how does our understanding of, of the biology of the mind help us to be better coaches um, for uh, our clients who come to us uh, and indeed for ourselves? Uh, 
in order to be you know healthier happier um, more productive and so in terms of how there, there was three there was three important things i think if i could pick the three biggest most important things that came out of my studies for that book sure. and they're, they're not rocket science in a way um, and you know anyone listening may think well yeah that's obvious isn't it well yes in a way it is but that's again you know the, when we look at something and say oh that's obvious i knew that then sometimes that's an excuse just to forget it and yeah. to think well okay fine you you know been there done that got the t-shirt and we can forget about it again but if you take these things seriously uh they make a huge difference so the first one was sleep sleep is really really important for our brain and for our health you know there's only a few things that you die if you don't get them one is air of course very quickly another is water food and the, the fourth is sleep if you don't sleep you die uh, takes a few weeks but you do um and the brain needs sleep in order to consolidate the the memories and the skills that you've done uh the brain needs rest um and healing every night it's really important and one thing really struck me uh with regard to some of the statistics um which is that uh, in in the UK of course we have this uh, daylight saving time where at the end of march the clocks go forward i think and you have one hour less sleep and even on one hour less sleep the uh, road traffic accidents due to people not paying attention spike dramatically the next day wow even you know one hour less sleep so to expect people to function well on poor quality and poor quantity of sleep is crazy and it's such a shame when you know hard working executives will say things like well you know yeah i can do fine on four four hours a four hours sleep a night uh, i i need you know i've got a, i've got a, I've got a lot of work to do right it's more important than sleep well in one way it is but in the other way they're they're working against themselves because if they took an extra two three hours of sleep they'd actually do better with the work that they had to do during the day yeah just one observation actually around sleep if you think about it in simple terms if you didn't eat for a whole 24 hour period at worst you'd be hungry but if you didn't sleep for a whole 24 hour period you'd start bumping into psychosis <laughs> yes that's the difference between the two kind of approaches isn't it <laughs> yes well i don't know I'm, i'm tempted to say we've all done it and then pulled an all-nighter i certainly have mm. and you're just useless the next day completely useless uh it's you know you you just lose a day <laughs> instead of instead of doing some good for yourself at night you just lose the next day so yeah absolutely so what were the other things that came out well exercise physical exercise because of course the brain is embodied it's part of the body and if the body isn't healthy then the brain doesn't do well either so physical exercise very important uh and the third is meditation some kind of meditation uh, or mindfulness practice has uh, really ironclad research in terms of of benefits for um, emotional intelligence emotional stability um focus concentration for the brain yeah all form part of resilience as well ironically yes yeah. yes So when I dove into the book there were a few areas I'd just love to explore with you. Mm. One was hot cognition. Tell us a bit about what that is. Hot cognition. Um yeah. Well the, the I guess the metaphor here um and we all there's been a metaphor like this for for thousands of years. The Greeks had this metaphor of the human being as as a charioteer and uh, they have two horses drawn in a chariot. One is the black horse which is represents emotions and one is the white horse that represents reason. and in the uh, metaphor which i think plato used first uh the charioteer is always trying to get these two horses to to kind of work together and the problem is very often the black horse of emotions kind of going off their own way uh and uh, drawing the chariot to one side where they don't want to go and sometimes that indeed that is our experience of emotions kind of take us over and and we do or say things that we regret afterwards 
um, which is a, a pity because emotions have enormous energy and to be able to harness that energy in a constructive way is is really, really important rather than allow the energy to either, you know, explode like in anger or to kind of implode like in anxiety or, or fear uh, and stop us doing something or in anger, you know, make us do something that we didn't want to do. Uh, so, you know, that's one metaphor. Now, the metaphor that I prefer is the hot and cold streams because all of our thinking is warm to some extent right it's you don't get anyone who's completely cold rational logical thought outside star trek you know outside the vulcan <laughs> yeah. uh, it doesn't exist you you couldn't do it actually uh, you you couldn't make decisions for a start so there's always emotion there's no thinking without emotion there's no emotion without thinking uh, it's just that our thoughts change temperature depending on what we're thinking about, who's with us, and, and all of these sorts of things. So sometimes the thinking is, is much hotter. It's got much more of an emotional component. So the, the part of, of the brain, uh, particularly the, the prefrontal cortex, that's involved with emotion uh, and integrating emotion is more active. And at other times, the part of the prefrontal cortex that's more about rationality and reason and, and logic is more active. So we kind of move between most of our thinking is fairly lukewarm. Occasionally, maybe if we're doing maths or something, it gets quite chilly. Uh, and then if we get really angry, it gets very hot indeed. Uh, so how do we how do we manage that? I think is the is the, the important question in terms of, of coaching neuroscience and this idea of of what sort of thinking and, and how do we best manage that uh, emotional intelligence as well? And one of the other areas that I really liked and I often find it self presents when I'm coaching is the whole notion of identity mm -hmm. or the labels people wear. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if you give us your spin on how identity forms a part of a coaching conversation and how we might want to help people pay attention to their identity. Oh, wow. Yeah, how long have we got? <laughs> a couple of days. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, identity is a strange concept. Um, and again, a bit like creativity or the brain, I think it's a process. I don't think it's a thing. Uh, I think that um, once you kind of decide your identity uh, and fix it, then I think you've lost something. I think you've lost a, an important part of living. So uh, an identity, uh, here's just a couple of thoughts. I think irreducibly we all are aware we can all say i am and that is in a sense quite impersonal uh, and the absolute bedrock of our identity we say everyone can say i am now the the things that then get pulled on top of that where people start to say, you know, I am a coach, I am a leader, I am a father, a mother, a child, a teacher, a, a good person, a bad person, whatever it might be. Um, those come from a process of living and experience, and sometimes we identify with those uh, for good or bad. So the, I think the quick answer would, would be um, identity is a process that's always under construction, we all have a bedrock to it that, that uh, the foundation of it, which is this feeling of I am. And I also think that um, it's more mutable and more changeable uh, and more choosable, perhaps, than we sometimes think. And it can often also create behaviours based on the identity you choose to wear. Mm -hmm. Because as you rightly said, you can choose that identity in different scenarios. Mm -hmm. And that comes with a different set of behaviours, right? Yes, yes. I mean, in, in many ways, we're fully functioning schizophrenics. You know, we, we, <laughs> we are different people to, diff to yeah. two different people, depending on the context. You know, we all know when I'm with yeah. my, my daughter, I'm a different sort of person to when I'm standing on stage giving a training or when I'm coaching or something like that. So right. we're, we're very flexible in that way, amazingly flexible. Uh, but at the same time, there is something there underneath that we can always come back to and, and know clearly yeah. to ground ourselves. 
So we're going to give folk an opportunity to dive into the work you're doing, find out about the book in a little while. Before we do that, though, this is where we turn the table a little and we get to hack into your years of experience of leading teams and leading others and just dive in to find out what your top three leadership hacks would be. Top tools, tips or ideas. Oh, wow. One would be be authentic, be yourself. Don't try to pretend to be something that you aren't because it doesn't work. Usually people people will see through it. So whatever leadership context you're in, be authentic. Uh, secondly, and this may be a bit of a paradox, um, you need to adapt to, to other people as, as to what they are. I think one style of leadership for everybody doesn't work. And I think leadership has evolved over the last 50 to 100 years from a time where it was, this is what you do to be a good leader, you know, learn these characteristics and you'll be a good leader, kind of laundry list thinking, uh, to, well, there's a whole set of skills here and people are very different. And um, leadership is a is a very mutable, changing uh kind of skill that you you've got to be very flexible in terms of you know it's not just about i am a leader but who are you leading because a leader without anybody as it were to follow them um doesn't exist you know you can't be a leader on your own crying in the wilderness so you you've got to to pay attention and adapt to the people that uh, are with you let's put it that way so that would be the second one the third one would be the ability and willingness to say no where necessary, because, you know, people who are good leaders are usually pretty good at, at things and therefore they are under a lot. Of, people ask them, you know, the better you are at something, the more people will ask you to do stuff. Uh, and this becomes a vicious circle whereby you start being pretty good at something. People start asking you then overburdening you and very soon because you're trying to do too much and spreading yourself too thin you lose that edge that you had at the beginning so i think uh, again part of being authentic is to say this is what i want to do and uh, this these other things while very interesting and i wish you the very best with them um they're not for me power of no really important love it yes the next part of the show we call it hack to attack so this is typically where something in your life or your work hasn't worked out well, could have even been quite catastrophic. But as an experience, you now use it as a force of good. What would be your hack to attack? There's many, there's many examples. Just maybe a more trivial one. Um, some years ago, I, I was involved in, in some uh, marketing I think it was through some social media or LinkedIn or something like that. And uh I sent out an email, which I meant to send to, to one or two people. I sent it out to, to a, a list oh, <laughs> of, of uh, some thousands of people. And, you know, you have that horrible, oh, my God moment. Yeah. You, you've just pressed send. And then you think, just a minute, uh, did I do that right? And then that horrible sinking feeling where, oh, God. Yeah. So, and, and uh, you know, a, a lot of people didn't like that at all. And I felt embarrassed. And there was there was a number of emails back from people. But it, it taught me, it taught me a lot. Um, it taught me to be able to, and I can remember this now, after it happened, it's going, you know, initial panic, yes, absolute panic. And then you go, okay, well, that's happened. And there's no way I'm going to get this back. So you better deal with it. <laughs> and um, so in that sense, it, it was a, a very clear example because often these things take much longer to, to happen. You know, you do something and it takes, carry on doing it and it takes maybe a few weeks. And then you think, oh, my God, you know, what have I done? Uh, and then there's a lot of trying to take things back or, or trying to change it or saying, no, I didn't really mean that or whatever it was. And which can sometimes make things worse or covering it up. You know, they say that uh, it's not the crime, it's the cover up that uh, gets you into trouble. Yeah, that's right. Um, so this was a, I think this was a good example where it's like, OK, that's done. Um, nothing to no way to get that back. So you better deal with it. So that was one lesson. And the second lesson was I've never done it again. I. <laughs> yeah. I, I made sure that I learned in excruciating detail how these things work <laughs> so that uh, 
that you know I, I was much more a master of communications <laughs> and marketing than before and even now I have a, a, an email address where there's a two minute um, delay that's programmed in so that uh, I press send and if it's yeah. wrong then I know oh thank god it hasn't sent yet it won't send for two minutes that's a perfect example of where neuroscience has created an, an instant reaction in you and <laughs> created a really big, thick layer of neuroplasticity. You know, <laughs> there's neuro pathways. I'm not going to repeat that one. <laughs> well, yes, you know, it's like with neuroplasticity. You, yeah, if you repeat stuff, you learn. But also you have one big emotional experience. Yeah. That also, it's like a very heavy skier <laughs> or, or like a bulldozer going down the ski slope. That's it. Tracks already made. There it is. It makes a blooming big track. <laughs> yeah. So the last part of the show, Joseph, we want to do is we get our guests to do a bit of time travel. You get to bump into yourself at 21 and give yourself some advice and some words of wisdom. What would it be? 21. Oh, my God. Oh, I don't know. It, it's like, hey, man, you know, I love you. You're going to be all right. <laughs> don't, don't sweat the small stuff, you know. Sleep well. And uh, it'll be okay. Awesome. Sometimes that's all it takes, right? It's just that little bit of uh, reassurance, and I like that. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, you, you from that perspective, you know, what how, what would you say to your twenty one year old self? But supposing you are twenty one, and some guy comes suddenly yeah. appears in your room and goes, "Hey, yeah, it'll be all right." <laughs> yeah, you know? I'm not sure. I'd have paid huge amounts of attention. But how would that change your life? Indeed. Or would it? Sliding doors, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that, that's the whole kind of crazy notion of time travel, isn't it? Is that you know you are who you are. You created what you've created because that Joseph at twenty one gave you the the permissions to do what you did. If you change that, then who knows what the future would hold? Mm. Hey, that's a whole deeper, meaningful conversation. That's not good. <laughs> yes. So I've loved chatting. I'm really delighted you're part of our community on the Leadership Hacker Podcast, Joseph. So how can our listeners get hold of a copy of the books? And I say books, there are many. And find out a little bit more about the work you've done. Well, first of all, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Facebook as well. So you can contact me there. Coachingthebrain.com is the website where you can read about the, the courses there. And um, I'm just starting the Creators Club. So uh, if you're interested in creativity, uh, intuition, and uh, hacking into to that, then you can get me at uh, joseph at thecreatorsclub.net. Brilliant. We'll put those links in the show note and uh, you can count me in. Uh, I'm absolutely in. Joseph, thanks ever so much for coming on the show. Some great stories, some great lessons, and thank you for helping the world on the journey you've been. And, and personally, uh, thanks for helping me on my journey too. Well, thank, thank you, Steve. It's it's a pleasure. It's uh, yeah, we 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 do what we do, and it's like uh, we all drop pebbles into the the lake, don't we? And the ripples go out, and we have no idea where the ripples go to and we hope that uh, they ripple against the shore in, in some good places and I'm really pleased that uh, it's happened so so thank you and uh, wish you the very best thanks Jesus really appreciate it I want to sign off by saying a thank you to you for joining us on the show too we recognize without you there is no show so please continue to share subscribe and like and continue to get in touch with us with the great news stories that we share every week and so that we can continue to bring you great stories, please make sure you give us a five-star review where you can and share this podcast with your friends, your teams, and your communities. If you want to find us on social media, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter, at Leadership Hacker, Leadership Hacker on YouTube, and on Instagram, the underscore leadership underscore hacker. And if that wasn't enough, you can also find us on our website, leadership-hacker.com tune into next episode to find out what great hacks and stories are coming your way that's me signing off i'm steve rush and i've been your leadership hacker <laughs>